welcome to the Workshop Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew, and joining me today is a special guest, one of two people in the entire world who has the coolest steel straight edge in the world, Mr. Matthew Sutter. That's, I do, um, on display. How you doing, everybody? Do, do you actually use it, or does it just sit on the shelf? Um, I haven't built it into my carry vest, but it is... It is accessible, and I I have used it. But I actually used it to cut leather on my, for my vest. So yeah, that, that's a I good spot. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It it it's not as functional as I'd hoped it would be. Honestly, like the the engraving on the on the 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 ruler part wasn't deep enough. But that's what happens with a prototype. And then when you find out that the guys are going to charge you ten times as much as they quoted you to do it, you just don't make a second prototype. <laughs> It was nice for cutting leather because it had had substance, it had weight, a nice straight edge, you know, with a nice taper down. So I was able to use my, my wheel or whatever. And it, it is a nice piece, but yeah, it's too bad that didn't work out. Yeah, I um, I sent one to, oh, shoot, what's his last name? Michael at Calavera Leather, leather there. Yep. And he, he'll show it, using it every once in a while for cutting leather and, and, uh, wasn't an intended purpose for it but yeah i can see how the heft of it is is good for that yeah and that that taper anyway it's a well-designed tool and it's a shame that there wasn't tons of people who were interested in buying them at the price that they needed to be but it's what it is well when i get my back wall on my shop done which is i have no idea when but i do have a spot as part of on display in the back wall which would be more visible so therefore may be used a little more often yeah that's that's one of the things that happens is if your tool ends up in a drawer it doesn't get used and so as ridiculous as those big tool walls are like they they are really a waste of space but at the same time it actually makes things functional yeah it's in my precise measuring and layout tool drawer well, that's that's good so Exciting things that are happening for you coming up. Anything in particular aside from uh, your, your month away coming to the greatest country on earth? <laughs> uh, yep, that's that's pretty much where I'm at right now. I am in the uh, month month ago scramble to get this current client job done. I promised an install date, which coincides with install. Everything goes right. I'm leaving for Canada and. I hope to not have to go back, but it may be already part of the contingency plan, but that's okay. And yeah, spending another, that'll be about two and a half, two and a half weeks in Canada coming up. So that'll be my second trip for the year. Hopefully I can keep my phone on dry land and not in the bottom of a lake like it is in Ontario. But yeah. you, here we yeah, are. Are you going to set up a proper two-factor authentication that you can get through this time is that just in case you know i should look i don't know how i have it set up on this new account but um i'll, I'll look at that later otherwise and it's it, going to become first do construction underscore millwork underscore again yeah uh it's just this this technical issue i'm having is it's so ob- obtainable but it's just not in the meta world so i I pretty much got to give it up and move on. And that's what I'm pretty much committed to now. Yeah. That's frustrating. On the one hand, like if you're not, if you're not going through the stress of it on the one hand, it's like, Oh, that's nice because I, you can kind of be confident that it's secure that way. But then on the other hand, it's really frustrating because like you said, your Facebook is still, active right like it's just yep. exactly the same so why the freak can't you it's the same freaking company yeah yeah i don't know it's frustrating so um i don't know if you have a different followership than than the others that have heard it but um i dropped my phone in the lake fishing in canada in june and can't get through my two-factor authentication to get back into my first two instagram account first two construction instagram and so I'm pretty much locked out. So I started a new profile with the underscore millwork. So, which I kind of already was going to start this pivot once I got the mill going 
and I was doing more consistent milling, I was going to try to to brand reference that a little bit differently. Um, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do it, but you know, the spam stuff I'm getting is for remodels and deck work and all this kind of stuff. And I, I'm not interested in that anymore. I'm trying to move more towards this mill work anyway. So I want to get the spam reaching out for mill work now. Yeah. So the, your current project, you're building a, like a built-in bookcase. Is that what you said? Yeah. This client reached out to me. Um, they had an existing built-in bookcase in this office or study, I guess it is. Um, and it was a house built in the early nineties. So it's got soffiting and everything's dropped eight feet, nine foot ceilings with a soffit all around and they want floor to ceiling. So I took out the existing, opened up the soffit, took out the pant or the uh, closet in that room next, next to it and doing a double built in floor to ceiling. Okay. So there's, there's a decent amount of renovation going on with it too, then not just, not just building the carcass and putting it in place. Yeah. And you know, I'm comfortable with my home construction um, background and remodeling background and a whole trailer set up to, to do all that. Uh, I'm good with doing that light demo, taking all the measurements, doing the design and going to the shop, building all the, all the casework and everything. And then I'll show up and install and put it all back. And hopefully it's uh don't have to come back and do that again. Yeah. So now you work, you work full time as a firefighter, right? What's your, what's your schedule like, like that? Are you like, like 24 on 24 off and then four close? Um, yes, I'm a full-time fireman. That's my, my salary check that pays for my, uh, business that loses all the money. Uh, um, and I work 24, 48. So I work for 24 hours off for 48 back for 24. And that schedule carries on forever. There is a special, every third week I get a extra day off. It's, it's, I don't need to try to explain it, but I just get a day off. So like in two weeks I get my Wednesday off and that means I'm in the shop Monday through Friday. Um, but I work, I work Sunday, Saturday on either side of that. Um, so that's nice. That gives me, that gives me some nice dedicated work. Um, a lot of times in the shop, I'm getting two solid days in the shop a week, maybe three. That's just part of it. But all my client work that I'm up front with that, they all know everything about that. And that's kind of really why I started pointing my work towards the shop. Uh, cause I was doing client work in their home. Um, in their backyard, in their space and COVID times, overtime, unforeseen holdovers, whatever it was, or had a long night where I didn't sleep and I have to go perform in, in the client space. I had built in this little padding to, to build out the shop and do all my work in the shop. So, yeah, well, you're, you're always more efficient in your shop than you are on any sort of site. doesn't matter how well set up your trailer is unless your trailer is your shop. Right. Right. And then, um, you know, like, like for now or today, for instance, like it's a Thursday. So I would have cleaned up, totally cleaned up my space, cleaned up my site, maybe left the trailer on the job, but I go to work tomorrow. I'm doing other things Saturday, Sunday, I go back to work Monday. So I don't go back to that client's space until Tuesday. And I'm not, I'm not leaving my, my stuff in a mess. So clean up and set up takes just as long for everybody. And I'll try doing it more often because of my schedule. So yeah. So yeah. I'm fun. So you're pretty busy as a firefighter or is like back, back when I was a firefighter, I was a volunteer, but it was, it was always like there were days where you did absolutely nothing. And then there was days when you were working for 24 hours straight. Is that kind of typical for you too? Or Yeah, I'm in a, I work for a, um, a suburb department of Mad our capital city, Madison here in Wisconsin. And I work, it's in Fitchburg and we have a city of 30,000. Uh, but there's, there's some differences with our population than a, let's say a bigger city, but it, it all depends. We're still not in the predictable everyday you're coming to work running 
five to 10 calls. You know, it, it's pretty steady. You could go all day with not much going on and then you're up all night, you know, so we're in that weird, unpredictable, um, population right now. But during the day we have fire inspections, we have other tasks to do. Plus I manage the fleet. I do all the fleet maintenance. So I have wrenches to turn and like, I'm not the I'm more of a coordinator, but there's a lot of little stuff that I can fix and manage myself. So I, I keep myself busy. So do you have like a similar breakdown in calls, like 10, 10 medical sort of things or accidents to every fire incident? Or I would say we, we go, we go on a lot of medical calls um, where we assist the, assist the paramedics on um, certain level calls. We, we get paged with, to go with them. Um, and you know, baby boomer generation is only getting older. They're only getting sicker and it's yep. definitely a trend in the stats for sure. And, uh, yeah, which means more lift assists, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just moved stations, uh, this week, actually. Um, there's, a some shuffling around on the, on the shifts and the staffing. So I got put over at a different station and this station has a lot nicer surroundings. It's kind of a lot quieter. It's out right on the edge of town, but the population is younger. Older. No, younger. Oh, younger. This one's younger, um, subsidized housing, a lot of that kind of stuff. So the, my call uh -huh. volume is changing from where I came from. That is the older Alzheimer wards, um, assisted living housing, um, you know, whole city blocks of luxury retirement, they're calling it. Um, so we didn't go on any calls much after eight. Things quieted down on that old side of town, but not where I'm going now. Yeah. Not, now your daytime will be a little bit slower and your nighttime will be not, not yep. a stereotype, but probably more drug related calls and stuff like that. Then. Yep. But I'll have more stories to tell. So I guess take it, take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's, yeah. Stories like, stories like, yeah, we have a list of all the houses that you do not go into without double gloving because of fentanyl. Not that that happens. Yep. Yeah. I'm, yep. So I'm getting ready. Uh, I've only worked, I've worked at that station before, but it's, uh, that was two years ago. I was assigned. So things have changed over that two years, two years. So, and of course you can't say anything because that's confidentiality. So yeah. that was all my experience. And so you're not, uh, you will have none of those experiences. <laughs> well, you know, just as long as you throw in some allegedly's and some, some vague references, it's fine. Somebody said that this may have happened. Wink, wink. <laughs> yeah. But anyway. So somebody said, Something may have happened regarding a bear in a tent, too. In the pre-show, we were swapping, uh, we were, well, I guess we weren't swapping anything yet, because I was just telling my bear stories from around here, but yeah. So what's this about a bear in the tent that you were mentioning? Well, we were talking about um, uh, my past that used to hunt in Idaho a lot for, for elk. Um, and one of our first years out there, uh, in a new area, we had a, we couldn't get tags in our normal area. So we went to a new area, which was a pretty heavy bear, um, bear population area, including grizzly bear. And this year was our first year in our own outfitters tent. We got like an army surplus straight wall tent. Um, and you can pretty much camp anywhere in the national forest. There's some rules you got to follow, but it's, it's pretty, pretty open to, to whatever you do. And, um, that year we had our kitchen set up inside the tent, right inside the first door, essentially that you walk in. And one night we were all laying there in our, in our cots and I woke up to something going through the pots and pans at the end of my feet, at the end of my cot. Um, and it wasn't any of us. We were all sleeping in a row in our cots, one, two, three, four of us. Um, so I kind of gingerly woke everybody else up next to me. Um, and that, whatever that was kind of stirred up the coop and 
out goes this thing. I'm not sure what it was, but when we woke up and we start to investigate with our flashlights, three out of the four of us got up out of our cots. Um, so you have three grown men in their underwear with a flashlight, maybe a sidearm or two, like creeping out the door. Three of us poke our heads out the door to see what it was. Uh, the bottom flap was open like a triangle up about three feet off the ground. And outside the tent was a snowmobile trailer that we hauled all of our gear out there with. And if you know a snowmobile trailer, the deck is on top of the wheels. And whatever was in our tent is now walking on top of the trailer. We can hear it walking on the ramps and stuff out there. So once we built courage to get out of the tent, whatever it was, was long gone into the woods. And through deductive reasoning, we are assuming that probably a smaller black bear was in our tent investigating our pots and pans because there are no raccoons out there. They're skunks, but a skunk wouldn't really get on top of a snowmobile trailer. Um, so we're, we're reason to believe not, that. Not loudly enough to hear it either. Right. Right. So, yeah, we think we had a visitor and I mentioned three out of the four of us. One, um, one individual had no idea the next morning when the sun came up and we were reliving the story. He had no idea. Slept his whole way through it. <laughs> so he would have been the first to go had it gone bad. Yeah, hmm. that's uh, I, that is legitimately one of my paranoias for sleeping, sleeping outside intense around here it's like it's because like i said in the pre-show there like <clears throat> i i i remember one year we had five or six black bears wander through our yard in like a two-month period right and just and one of them we saw all the time until he um died of natural causes He's like, when he's showing up a little too often, he caught a bad case of lead poisoning. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's just black bears all over the place. And like I said, there's, there's grizzlies kind of too close for comfort, really. Like, I'm not, I'm not worried about them, but at the same time, I have kids now. So, you know, if they do come around, they might die of natural causes as well. Yeah. But then we also have our our wonderful um, forest conservation conservation officers uh, reintroduced cougars, and so haven't seen any. I haven't seen any around where we are, but five. Let's see, one, two, yeah, five or six miles away from us, our neighbors they have. Um, that's. That's a different language, probably for people in New Jersey, five or or New York, five or six <laughs> miles away from us. They're our neighbors. They're like three houses down. <laughs> they they have trail cams back there, and they've counted up to five different different cougars wow. roaming around down there. And then wolves. We have we lose we lose a cow or a couple calves a year to wolves usually yeah, on I the saw flip you. side there's no poisonous snakes it's all regional i guess take what you want whether you want people on the new jersey turnpike or cougars roaming 5 miles away that's 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 probably the thing is probably more people get killed by road rage than get killed by cougars <laughs> i saw you counting there were you just counting the streets we're counting the roads between you and you and that five mile mark. No, I was counting corners because I I know it's because I know it's um it's it's a section and a half to the first corner, so that's a mile and a half, and then it's two sections south to the next corner, so that's two miles, and then it's two sections to the end of that road, so that's another two miles. So five yep. and a half miles, six miles. I'll be uh, in a month when I'm up there. I'll be in the same language because that's, that's very much how you reference your area. I mean, I know they do like sections and grid line stuff here, but it's not referenced. I guess we're more county based, at least in Wisconsin. Well, yeah. So Western Canada up to 
up to the mountain range from from like the middle of Manitoba all through to to the Rocky Mountains was all surveyed out in the I think it started in like the late 1800s to mid 1800s and through and then so it's all it's all like based on meridians and and townships and sections and yeah so so you can go up you can go up and find the corner the corner of our section and find the little brass pin that they set into the ground there anyway yeah it's it's a it's a different language like I'll be listening to like the working hands podcast or something like that or or, or um What's the other ones that I'll hear it every once in a while? Oak and Steel. Yeah. I'll just throw it out there. Oak and Steel podcast. Oh yeah, that's my favorite podcast actually. <laughs> them, them, and and Working Hands. Those are my two favorite. Le- legitimately, those are the only two that I actually listen to consistently. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else, I kind of like hit or miss. But um, now, yeah, but you guys don't talk about the traffic all the time. You're always talking about cookies, cookies or weather, and and, and lawn care. That's yeah. Like, yeah, see, my see pod- that's where that's where you, you 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 need to be you need to have a couple kids yourself or something because then you, you it would make perfect sense because you're just you and Michael there that you just hit all of the dad topics all the time. <laughs> well, I mean, I told him I think this week or last week my podcast partner is way into his lawn and he starts confiding in me and all of his struggles with it. And as you just bring it on yourself, you know, I, I get it. I, I'm, I like to be a proud lawn owner myself, but in the end, when the backyard is full of dog poop from two large dogs, I don't know. There's just not much I can do other than scoop it up and mow it and move on. Yeah. See you next week. Yeah. Well, my lawn has two foot high trees in it right now, so I can't say anything all over the place. Yeah, but see, I, I'm I'm enjoying your watching your journey you got going on here. I'm I'm way into your compound build. I always like that kind of stuff. Yeah, well I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping I'll have my walls up and roof on by the end of October. That's because uh I'm I'm doing SIPs for the walls. Nice. Uh, structural insulated panels for people who don't know what SIPs are, basically osb skinned styrofoam with all the structural members all pre-built inside of them so my entire house is coming as 32 pieces and then our our neighbors they're a they're a religious community kind of kind of similar to mennonites and amish combined called the the hutterites i don't know if they're down in wisconsin at all they're not but we we are friends with the Hutterites where we go hunting. Yeah, up in Saskatchewan, there's lots of them. So yep. uh, the local Hutterite colony here and there, they have uh, they have all the toys. They're the ones that they're the ones that came down. If you saw my recent reel here with the concrete truck, so they do they do precast concrete, and uh, so they came down, poured all my concrete, and they have a 32 ton crane that they're going to bring down, and we'll stand all my walls up with that. And I'm kind of half debating building my roof on the ground, and then just picking it up and setting it on with the crane. Why not? But I don't know if I'm good enough to get it square <laughs> and straight doing that. It's like uh, my my brother when he built his house, or at, well, I helped him build his house down the road from here. That's what we did. But I don't know if I if I'm good enough at at making sure everything's solid and square. I mean, the, the, there's yeah, houses ahead. going up around here in dense population suburbs in the matter of weeks. Uh, it's you just build the walls, and then you just put the cherry on top and just make sure it's somewhat pick the middle. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, going back and forth. I'm definitely, if, if they're bringing the crane down to do it though, I'm definitely installing all my windows before I stand my walls up, Yeah. at least on the ups. Yeah. Probably all of them. If my windows get here in time, because it would be so easy to just set it down into the hole, nail it in quick and then stand it up. 
and then I can do all the caulking and flashing and stuff after. But anyway, that's so the they plan. have they have like the ultimate compound of things that you need. Like that's your guy, the Hotterite Colony. Is they just have everything you need. Oh yeah, yeah <laughs> they they legit do. Is the um, the what was it last week? I posted a reel using the CNC plasma table to cut out the quick attach stuff for my excavator. I don't know if you saw that one or not, but yep. Yeah, that was that's them. Um, yeah, they have yeah they, they they basically have everything. And then and then one of the family friends, if if they don't have it, one of the family friends has a uh, has a big oil field construction company and a huge farm. So if they if if the Hutterites don't have it, then I can call Rick and hopefully he'll have it. And I mean he'll charge me more because his is a business, but. Well, the Hutterites are business too, but anyway, that's where yeah. uh, I had I had them dig dig our uh, our farm pond dug out for our water supply because it was going to cost us fifty two thousand at a bare minimum for a well, and so I called I called my friend Rick and I was, I was like, well, what would you charge me to do a dugout? And he's like, ah, oh, six grand. <laughs> It's like okay, done. I can put in one heck of a water treatment system for that extra forty thousand dollars. Yeah, that's that's what I you know, for those who don't know my shop and my shop space. That's in all my content. That is at uh, my family farm, which is an hour away from my house. But I work at the firehouse, halfway in between. So everything's a half hour away, or the hour home that I got to take, or than hours straight out to the shop. Um, and so I'm out there doing a lot of things and, and my wife gets out there occasionally and we had some, some guests in town, some friends that have seen and heard everything about it, but never been to the shop and the farm. So we took them out there and there were some things that I just couldn't quite get put away fast enough and had to answer some quick questions of where did this come from? What is this for? And all that sort of stuff. Cause I'm building a nest out there. I'm building my own compound. I'll be self-sufficient. So is that, that the end goal is to take over the family farm then or what? Yeah. Uh, I mean, 30 years ago we quit. Well, my dad and my grandfather quit farming, dairy farming. Um, and so the auction was about 30 years ago. Um, but my grandpa and grandma have lived out there ever since. And I, you know, I was doing like, I've been in business for 10 years now. Um, but I was doing a lot of home building and stuff. And about eight years ago, I started constructing this shop because I needed some, I had shop tools and an old space and they were just in the barn getting rusty. So I started like building this shop. And and I think you were talking about this for your, your topic for the show, but I had this vision for this shed, this building, and I'm still working on completing it however many years later. Um, and, and so that's just where I've kind of staked my claim. But ever since 30 years ago, we've, I've always wanted to get back to that farm. I've always wanted to be back on that property. So, um, it is a long-term plan for my wife and I, we're working through family and, and all that negotiation, but it is somewhat in the works at the very early stages. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, you bring up the topic that we're kind of heading towards here is, it's like going with the flow versus following a set plan, you know. And and, and like I said in the pre-show, there you, you you strike me as the guy who has a plan, but I don't know. Do you struggle to follow the plan, or do you grab opportunities as they come, or is that I, one and the same? Um. No, I have defined very long-term plans a vision in my own head. Um, I don't even know if I've fully been able to articulate it to myself. Like it's just, it's there. Um, I don't even know what it looks like, but it's there. But in the short term, in the day to day, I keep jumping on opportunities. Um, the work and the clients that come to me, that's a, a short term um, opportunity. All these opportunities build towards something, which is that greater thing. Um, this bookcase job, I, 
I never thought I'd be spraying finish, but it's kind of what this job demanded. And now the next job is demanding a spray finish. So now I'm leveling up and going into spray finish. And you'll see next week how I debut and handle all that in a 20 by 20 space. Um, and really probably the biggest explanation for all this is the milling operation. Um, again, taking advantage of opportunities, but it's really building a long-term bigger, bigger plan that I have for, for the, the space at the farm, utilizing the yard where I have 135 logs laying now, um, for milling the partnership with Grandberg to do big milling. Um, some, I got some seven foot wide trees out there. I'm going to be doing Ooh. and yeah. Um, and I don't know how that's going to go yet, but I, I'll figure it out. There's always a way. Are you, you looking into getting yourself a band mill as well, or just, are you going to suffer through doing everything with the chainsaw mill? <laughs> so here we go. I, there was trees falling down on the farm, legacy trees in my mind. Um, and they're like bur oak trees and they're over a hundred years counting the rings, but you know, as, as a child, my youth growing up there, these trees are legacy trees for the farm. And I wanted to process them to into something other than just firewood. We have yeah. plenty of firewood. Um, so that's where the chainsaw milling stuff came into. But then as I started looking at bandsaws for whatever reason, and I get into these obsessions and I just deep dive, I found a local auction, um, like right in our same town, that does like consignment auctions and they had a uh, TMG. They continually have TMG stuff, which is out in uh, BC, I believe. Or are you familiar with that brand TMG industrial? Yeah. So yeah, I'm so TMG industrial is, I mean, it's all Chinese import stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it, is it Richie brothers? Is that the, the auction um or is it just a local company ours is a local but it's very much like that essentially okay because um, i think richie brothers this is this is just supposition on my part i think they own tmg and oh. it's basically their like chinese import stuff that they dump into their auctions and and take a profit on well nonetheless um I was watching the sales of these mills on this local Wisconsin surplus site and got going into one one day and got the winning bid. And I got, I got it for the lowest I've seen them go for in the last three or four months. So all justified sales and deals and good opportunities on my part. So I have a 30 inch bandsaw mill that I've, just opened the crate on it sat in the crate for two years and I'm just getting to it. Mike and I are trying to oh. produce this and uh, I want to exclusively cover it on my YouTube channel just to show the step-by-step -step how it goes together, knowing that it's a Chinese are very cheap, cheap mill and just give, give some content for a future buyer to make their own decision on that. But so, so here's, Here's my take on them. I haven't used one of them specifically, but uh, I don't know if I've said this in the past on the podcast or in my social media or not, but I'm the ninth generation in my family to have a sawmill. So it's it's that's one of those things that my family has a lot of experience with. <laughs> what am I in for? I think you'll be just fine. They're, they're a bandsaw mill. I, I, it's literally two wheels and a blade and some sort of drive power, right? Like they're pretty yep. simple. And I think the TMG ones, I've, I've struggled to not buy one a few times. Like be like, oh, I, I really want to get an, a mill again. And you know, it's going for like 1800 bucks or whatever, or 1500 bucks. And I'm like, ah, oh, I want to buy it, but my wife will kill me if I do. So I don't. Well, that's where it just shows up, and then yeah. she finds it months down the road. But no, something like that. She was on. It's we're on the up and up with content. that. Yeah. Well, 
that's where I come home. I say, this is a great plan. I got all this ideas and all this things I'm going to do for it. And there it sits waiting for me two years later. But, um, I mean, in, here again, in the meantime, I, I was working with uh, stump grinding and arborist here locally that was just taking their trees to the landfill. And so I was picking them up from their site. They were dropping them. I was picking them up from their site. So I was, that's where I built my log arch trailer um, and just started hoarding all these logs. So now I want to get back, really get into the milling side of things. And- so here's my question for you then. Like on, on your... On your Oak and Seal podcast, there you you and you and Mike talk about about like making secondary streams of in, income and you know passive income and that type of stuff. And I, and I'm not disagreeing with that as a, being a good thing to do. But but when you're when you're in a situation like you are, where as a firefighter you're not paid peanuts, you you pro, you're probably making decent money. You're not making you're not making Elon Musk money. But but you're making you're making better than McDonald's money by a lot. Um, so you don't necessarily need to be doing the client work to to pay your bills, right? I'm assuming your your wife's probably working as well. So so you're you're in a situation where you don't necessarily need to be making additional income. What's 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 the thought process behind? choosing to do client work versus choosing to put together the mill and do something sheer cheerly for the enjoyment of this is something I've wanted to do. And I want to do. Well, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know. I, cause I, every time I do a client job, it seems in the end to almost cost me more money than I make money, but that's because every job I take, I level up. So I'm reinvesting and there's all this kind of, um, notion with that, but really, um, it's just trying to get, um, sustained supplemental income is, is really what, what the long-term goal is, especially feeding into buying the farm. There's not really a break on that. I'm still outright buying a farm. So I'm going to need, need to continue to have my full-time salary, benefits that whole thing but i gonna need the supplemental income to feed into that and help with the cash flow and then it also justifies having a presence at that space because that's where my business is and so i'm really trying to feed this machine for the next five years not to give my grandpa an end an end date but um just <laughs> he trying doesn't to listen plan. to this one anyway no 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 he doesn't but it's challenging it's, it's I just saw a reel today. Here's how I lost money. Five different ways I lost money this month. And that guy is a far bigger business than I got. It's pretty much pretty true. All the ways. That's yeah. That's all the ways I lost money. Um, so so this kind of begs another question. You said five years, and and not to not to stick you on that. This is your plan for sure, and you have to. But you said five years. Lots of fire departments specifically have like a forced retirement date. Um, does yours have that? Like you turn 60, you, you have to retire sort of thing or 20 years you have to retire. No, there's no force. Um, it's an eligibility, um, in Wisconsin, you gotta, you know, you're fully vested after 20 years, but, um, your retirement window starts to open up about 50. I don't, in reality, it's like 53 and a half or something like that. Um, but I'm only at the halfway mark, but I'm, I got some time to go. So, you know, looking forward to retirement, this will definitely be another thing, you know, thing I'm going to go do at post retirement, but I don't know. I might be worn out and tired by then. I might just not do anything. So we'll see. Just maintain the compound. You're going to end up like my, my one brother. He's like, he's, I should, I should do a, a social media tour of his place sometime because he's got all sorts of, weird stuff collected and he's always like he 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 carries around an undisclosed amount of cash with him all the time just just so he can if he sees something cool he can buy it and so he'll be like oh that's awesome and he'll whip out a couple thousand bucks or whatever and 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 buy it and his his kind of standing joke is 
that he's going to add it to his estate sale. So he's buying all sorts of projects and, oh, I want to do this and this will be a fun project and this will be a fun project. It's going to go into my estate sale. Yep. That's, that's my language here at home with my wife is you're going to have one hell of an auction someday. Just sell it for 10 times what I told you I paid for it. That's the important (laughs) thing. Yeah. Yeah. My collection of wrenches is really starting to grow. I got wrenches in every building, which is necessary. You know, you just, downtime trying to go get wrenches at a different different shed <laughs> time saver yeah that's a that's actually a real product productivity hack is is make sure you have the tool you need to fix the tool on the tool right or to yep. adjust the tool so you don't have to go find it there's screwdrivers are cheap allen keys are cheap wrenches unless you're a, a snap-on junkie wrenches are cheap yep and um you know, most of my time out there, I spend in the shop in one designated space, but I got stuff in pretty much every building and some of my business works out of different parts of different buildings. And I could have four different golf carts to run around the property. And I bet you at one point they'll all end up in the same spot and I'm on the other opposite end and I need to go walk to get one, you know, never fails. So that's why you need to build yourself just like a big conveyor belt. So yeah. just step on it at like you know like having airports or whatever right Just yeah step on and it'll bring you over i mean at this point i'm i'm i'd be happy with some sort of streamed audio throughout the whole compound so i have the same listening feature in every building wherever i go i can continue to listen to whatever it is i'm listening to those are called headphones i know but then they're in your ear all the time and can't hear the birds and everything else first yeah, first, I hear first level that, problems actually. i don't i don't i don't like having stuff in my ears all the time and that's where i i don't i don't listen to as much podcasts as i potentially maybe could because most of the time i don't like having stuff in my ears and i also don't like having a speaker blaring so i'm kind of kind of stuck but yeah Shop time for me, it's in silence. I really don't listen to much. I, I drive, you know, today I was on the road for two hours to and from the shop. So that's where I get all my listening time in. But when I'm in the middle of it, I, I don't listen to anything. It's too easy to get distracted, lose a finger. So your your decision-making process then on on achieving your goals isn't so much a, I have, I have my roadmap all laid out you have a you you more have a destination in mind and then you're you're taking steps towards um towards your end goal then right you're not like you're taking opportunities that will elevate you or move you towards that whether it may cost you a little bit right now hopefully it moves you forward is that that kind of how you you're approaching life yep yeah pretty much and you know, at the firehouse, that career path is pretty much set. I mean, I tried for a promotion. I made the promotion list, I think. Um, you know, that's that's pretty set. That's pretty, pretty structured. It's outside of the station and the rest of of life is what I'd take this course of action with. That's, uh, I was reading a a paper not too long ago about uh oh what was the uh forget the exact topic now but anyway have you ever heard of the mechanical turk uh so it's this it's this chess playing robot thing that they some guy made in the early 1800s late 1700s i think is when it was around uh anyway and this this mechanical turk could put up a pretty good fight about with just about anybody playing chess, right? Grandmasters, the whole nine yards, anybody, it could, it could do a pretty good job. And, uh, and so it turns out that the mechanical Turk wasn't actually a, a robot. What it was is, is a box. And then there was a guy crammed inside running the thing. <laughs> playing chess right 
and and the interesting thing about it is that that uh, there wasn't a specific guy in the Mechanical Turk. So what uh, the guy who owned it and took it to the different cities, he he'd get there a couple days before the Mechanical Turk was supposed to be there, kind of incognito, and he'd go around all these chess clubs, and he'd just you know find somebody who who would be quiet about it and pay them to climb inside this mechanical Turk and, and do, do his thing. Right. And, and so the, uh, kind of the, the gist of this paper that I was reading, it, it was, it was pointing out the fact that, that we often think of things like chess as this, like chess mastery being a unique ability for people, right? Like, Magnus Magnuson or whoever the current now he's a strong man. Yeah. Uh it is a Magnuson right now. He's like the world champion of chess or whatever. But anyway, um is we look at those people as like, oh wow, this is the this is the amazing chess guy of our generation. And and yet this the people who are playing as the mechanical Turk were just about as good. Right? And and then the paper kind of went on more and explaining about about chess and you you think that people have these you know see the see the game played out twenty thirty moves in advance and manipulate their opponent to into their path right and and that's actually not how grandmasters of chess function they they don't they're not thinking fifteen moves in advance what they're doing is they're looking at the board and saying, this is the next best move, right? Like, obviously they're, obviously they understand if they do this, then there's this potential over here and there's potentials to, for this to happen over here. So they are thinking in advance, but not in the, not in the, in the linear step one, step two, step three, step four way that we often think about it. And so that's where we're kind of talking to you one of my goals was you seem like you're you're kind of on the path that you want to be on but you're also not on a on a solidly structured I'm taking step 3 now and tomorrow I'm going to take step 4 so has that brought you joy in life Matt <laughs> um it actually has yeah it's been frustrating but um it's taken me into in the path that I into work that I I didn't know I enjoyed either. Um, uh, there was a, a stint where I was working for a, a high end um, landscaper, and he was doing all these uh, big hardscapes and that. And he landed a couple jobs back to back that wanted significant timber frame structures, pavilions, and a pergola in their backyard. And it was part of his design. And he came to me saying, and and we knew each other prior to this. He's like, can you pull this off? Is this, can you do this? And I said, yeah, sure. And we worked through it. And, um, I mean, on my first two construction page, that's pretty much one of the top, top things that I have pinned. And I mean, the job of that scale, the one job took me a year and a half to work through and I was doing it solo. Um, but that took me on a path into this timber framing stuff that took me out to the timber in that designated a spot in the barn for timber framing. And now I have aspirations of timber framing our house if we ever get to build one at the farm. So um, it's, it's created new passions and new enjoyment. Um, don't get me wrong. I still don't mind building houses, but I would be fine not stick framing another another house like I got into this industry doing way back. So, yeah, that's if, if I had more time, I would have loved to timber frame my house. Like there is, there is nothing, there's nothing as cool as a nice timber frame house in my, yeah. I don't know if reality is going to meet that expectation or living displaced, you know, if we're at the farm and my wife and I and two dogs are 
living in a camper or however that's going to look for, I don't know how long, like, I don't, I don't know the reality with this, but, um, I mean, much like you said, just looking at the chessboard and, and looking to see what the next move is and, and what comes my way is what's got me this far. Some may know me as a stone urinal. I don't know where I got that from, but, um, I saw people making, um, making sinks out of stone uh, bathroom vanity sinks and that sort of thing. So I, I took it to a different level. And then in the end of this weird idea came a, a stone urinal that's in my shop. So that's just how it goes. Yeah. And, and that, that speaks to, I think that speaks to creativity because the reality of it is the, the stone urinal, that's a cool project and it's, and it's a unique idea. I haven't seen another one prior or since but in reality it's not that much different than a, a stone sink right? right and and the and and again the reality of that i i haven't i haven't done a lot of stone work but aside from time how difficult really was it you basically just hacked at it with an angle grinder and a diamond blade for hours right yeah um I had a about a not, year and a half. Not to negate the the talent and <laughs> skill, I'm just well, no, hundred um, percent. I I did have about a year and a half in my past where I did stone restoration and stone masonry work. Um, so I had a, again, I had enough knowledge, had a baseline skill, yeah, to to know how to at least get started. And but I just took it as it came to me and and knew of certain tools of the trade that would get me certain results and through experimentation and some investment. Um, I got a hole chiseled out and a whole cord through and, and all the the fine features that I needed, but yeah, it's just time. And I definitely shortchanged the polishing Um, towards the end. I just, I was over it. You can only polish a stone (laughs) so much. Um, so I just moved well, on. That's one of those things where, where like for, for an experiment and, and for the idea, is there a, is there a point in bringing it to the nth degree, right? Like, like, sure, you could have made it perfect and you could have made it glossy smooth so the urine trickles satisfyingly <laughs> down perfectly, right? Like you could have done that. But, but is there... Is there value in that to you? Um, no. I mean, I think towards the end, I was at like 6,000 grit or something like that, watt polishing, and I'm just like, this is enough. But I, it was all for the Working Hands podcast, and I was all to the, the get the gold on um, on that competition. Not a competition. It was a challenge. Um, and um, it took more time to get ready for the final reel the final, the final uh, project post. That's, that's what really started taking my time. Um, And maybe I should reshare that on my, on my current social to, to bring that back again, but that was a good time. Yeah. It wouldn't probably wouldn't hurt. Yeah. No, that's, that's where I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking 10, 15 steps ahead in my house build right now. And, and as you kind of have to, you, you have to plan ahead. Otherwise you'll be behind all the time. But I, in my bathroom, I absolutely hate tile work. But, but at the same time, I really like, you've seen the showers where you got nice tile and then you have like the curved river stone kind of waterfall type of effect on things. Yeah. I really like that. And so I'm... I'm in this 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 struggle in my head of do I want to do that because I want to bring it to the nth degree because I'm building my forever home or do I just bloody well want to get it done? Yeah, and I guess that's that's a follow up question I have for you. Like, obviously, winter is coming for you faster than the rest of us, um, and you have a displaced family trying to build your home. Or, at what point are you just trying to get in the home and you'll you'll live in a little bit of disarray until next year when you can finish it a little bit better? Or are you just 
Do you have like future outbuilding plans and projects too? Yeah, there's future outbuildings. Like I don't have my, my current shop is also going to be my solar building. So I'm going to have my, so I'm going kind of semi off grid. I'm, I'm not hooking up to the grid for power, but I do have natural gas. So, so I'm, so my current shop is only, is only 20 by 16, which lots of people are going to say, oh, that's great. That's huge. But my previous shop was a thousand square feet. And my shop before that was a 40 by 40 two story barn. Yeah. So 300 square feet is a little cramped. But uh, so I do have plans to build a bigger shop. But yeah, as far as as far as that goes, the 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 real struggle is is not so much getting it done in time as much as keeping on track with my masters and getting progress on that and being a parent because my wife went back to work this week. She's she's teaching again. Um and then she's doing a master's as well right now. So, so it's like, what's the, what's the priority? We're not, we're not living in the trailer anymore, which changes things. Uh, when we, when we first moved, the house we're living in now wasn't available and we weren't aware it was going to be available. Uh, it's my, my aunt was living in it and then just, just before we moved or just after we moved I don't remember she she had a problem and and was in the hospital for a bit in rough shape and so then she decided she was going to move back closer to her 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 kids and so then this house became available but it's also it's also only a two-bedroom house so three kids and two parents and two bedrooms. I mean, it's straight up luxury if we were living in, you know, 1870. Yeah. Because we have plumbing and, and heat and keeping that in mind is important. But so when winter hits, it's, it's like, I, we're not, we're not going to be cold and freezing to death. So, so some of the dynamics have changed, but that's, that played into where I spent money as far as how the house is getting built. Uh, I don't know if I said here or the, or the pre-show, but I'm building my house with sips on the, on my exterior walls. So those are structural insulated panels. They're super, you know, six and a half inches of styrofoam basically. So it'll be very well insulated, but the biggest advantage is I'll be able to have uh, my floor deck by the end of a week and a half, I will have a closed in insulated locked up house. Right. So it'll, it'll go up really fast. All my insulation will be basically there already. Uh, and then I will do a spray foam, uh, spray foamed roof. So then it's just a matter of turning on some heat. And since I'm off grid, I have power, I will have power already. Um, so I'll be able to just kind of pick away at it, turn on my heat, keep the house warm and, and build throughout the winter. It will, it'll slow down obviously, but yeah, to answer your question, I don't know. Yeah. I will, I I will do the next to best thing that moves my goal forward. I get it. Uh, it was, I don't know what year it was, but about this time of year, it was the 1st of October, actually, more specifically, I moved into a camper full-time in Wisconsin, and I did that for about two and a half years, uh, two winters for sure. So your trailer struggles that you were anticipating for this winter coming up, I lived that. And heat and power and all your taken for granted luxuries when they're when you rely on them to survive that's it's pretty it's pretty interesting but it was just me at the time yeah yeah well when 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 we moved here like my family my parents and I when I was a kid when we moved here we we had yeah we lived in the the camper and the trailer for months and then moved into a a uh, mobile home 
that wasn't much bigger than a trailer and for a couple years. So I, I'm no I'm no stranger to similar similar experiences. The the flip side is my my wife. She was born in the same house that her parents. Like we've been married for 18 years now, and her parents just sold the house that she was born in. So she she lived in the same house her entire life. And uh, yeah, I've 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 been an upheaval and uproot to her life. <laughs> we this is our uh, this is our eighth resident ninth residence since we've been married. Oh, and I saw it saw it firsthand here on your on your post today. You got greener pastures. Everywhere you go. Yeah, hopefully. That's that's one of the things, though, you know, like going through life, you, you, you have a lot of things where you're... When I went to university, I had a plan, and then that plan changed, and then you pivot again and make a new plan, and then that plan changed, and then you pivot again, and you're on a plan where you're like, okay, this is the plan, and then you have an injury that, that you have no control over, and so you pivot again and make another plan, and then... That anyway, that snippet right there. Take that, take that 10 second snippet. That's me every tax season walking into my tax business tax accountant. I'm always pivoting. There's always a little bit of a new plan that's costing me money. So at the end of the year, it doesn't look good every year in a row. Yep. On the other hand, you have a lot of depreciating assets to keep your tax bill low. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's you, you sound like the perfect person to take over a farm. <laughs> yep. And when we were I was doing some soft talk with, with a potential lender, um, he asked for, a, he's like, Oh, you got your business. Oh, you run your business out of that property. Great. What do you have any assets? I said, Oh, I got a whole list of assets. Most of them are already paid off. I, you know, I don't really, I don't really have any outstanding debt on any of them. So there we go. I can just, wish all my tools away and get 10 cents on the dollar and make a monthly payment. <laughs> yep. But yeah. Borrowing money as a self-employed person is so frustrating. Yeah. That's but... I'm very thankful for my career path. Well established with, with salary money and, and benefits and paid vacation and everything, not to brag, but I'm very fortunate for that. Yeah, it is. It's very beneficial. That's the, uh, yeah. Now that my wife's back to work, she can do all the borrowing and I'll do all the spending <laughs> instead of all the borrowing and all the spending. Yeah. Yeah. Just anyway, the signature. We've been at this. Huh, yeah. We've been at this for a while. We should probably wrap up before people get bored of us talking about plans and pivoting. But so do you have any, uh, any parting words of wisdom that you care to share from your experience of planning and pivoting? Uh, just enjoy the the journey, make the most of it. Um, it's it's going to be more frustrating than fulfilling at point at times, most of the time. But if you keep working towards something you at least enjoy, um, in my case, the milling, I'm really looking for that just to be some pastime, just some some quiet time. So just stick with it. You might have to scale down, scale up a little bit here and there, but just stick with it. Keep keep working towards it. That's a ridiculous thing to say I'm doing for a quiet time, running a <laughs> sawmill uh, or a chainsaw mill. That's definitely not quiet. It's soothing. Yeah. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. There's two things, two, two of the most satisfying things in life for me. Uh is is sawing something and opening up the log and cutting hay. There's there's something super satisfying about going through a standing field of grass and then behind the tractor there's just a nice little wind row of of piled up fluffy hay. Those two things are just like they're loud and they make you smell bad, but they're very satisfying. And anybody so enjoy in the, the know, journey. anybody in the know can smell that right now. You just hit a sensory sensory whatever you know the term yep yeah that's that's what I, I tell tell my wife all the time is there's there's two smells that that i really like and and that's desert jasmine 
and that has to do with an experience that I had when I was living in Los Angeles. And and the smell of wild mint and fresh cut grass from uh, from the hay fields. Yep. So my two favorite smells in the world. Not your lawn, Michael. Hay field, alfalfa. Yeah. Not just not just green grass. <laughs> it's got to have some wild mint in it. A little bit of uh, you know a little bit of timothy, a little bit of clover. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of slough grass. Anyway, so thanks for coming on. Why don't you uh, tell everybody your your uh instagram handle and your youtubes and all that <laughs> yeah so first to construction instagram is my pro my portfolio um don't message me there i can't get to it but that's that's where i came from first to construction underscore millwork is my future and you can find me on facebook on one of those two things and youtube there's a few things but be some more on youtube coming coming your way and then when you drop your next phone in the lake it'll be first do construction <laughs> underscore millwork underscore attempt to or will oh. that be just like the sign from the gods that you're just not on social media anymore potentially potentially but i'll save uh i'll save my invention for the after show sounds good let's head over there right now and we'll have a brief conversation and thanks for the teaser on the after show thanks for everybody who has uh tuned in and listened and supported on patreon and all that jazz and if you have any questions send questions to questions at workshop therapy podcast.com i appreciate it and we'll head over to the after show see you then so if you found anything from this episode to be helpful and you want to reinforce it for yourself i'd like to invite you to share it with a friend in the next 24 hours that'll help reinforce it in your mind and it'll help those around you which is always a good thing. So thanks again for listening, and now I'd like to say thank you to all the amazing patrons of the Workshop Therapy Podcast. You guys make the show possible. If you're finding the show helpful and you want to support it, there are a few tiers, including a simple $1 a month option to just say thanks. For $5 a month, you can get access to the patrons-only feed that has a pre-show and a post-show, in addition to the regular podcast all-in-one feed. You all know that the good stuff happens after the official mics are off, right? If you can't support financially, I totally understand but I'd love it if you left a five-star review or told a friend about the podcast. If you have any questions or feedback, I'd love to hear that as well. Send it to questions at workshoptherapypodcast.com and I'll get it on the show. I want to say thank you to all the patrons of the Workshop Therapy Podcast, but especially to the founding fathers, and they are Mr. Matthew Serio from Argiano Serio, Mr. Brad Harrison of Brad's Customs, Mr. Keith Drennan of Blackthorn Concepts, Mr. Eric Peterson of Overall Maker Works, Mr. Brandon Millichamp of Tectonic Creations, and the one and only the Grant Alexander. So a special thank you to the founding fathers, and thank you to everybody who supports and shares the Workshop Therapy Podcast.